talked last week about dying with Christ, um, about being buried with Christ, about coming alive and being raised to walk in a newness of life with Christ. We talked about dying every day and walking that life, a life marked by the cross together, about burying the old man together, about saying farewell to the old self as a community, praying with each other through the dark hours of our Easter Saturdays and rising up together into new life about being built together and knit together and growing together into one house, to one body and one temple for the Spirit of God. Next week is Mother's Day. And my understanding is that uh, Kathy will be preaching. And she will be talking about a life in bloom, about a life opened out to God, a life of vibrancy and color, of summer and heat, of maternal warmth of a life lived in all the hues of Solomon's splendor. So today our task is to walk from here to there, from a life lived dying every day to a life overflowing with color and stacked with splendor, a life full to the brim of life and living, which is apt because we are very gently and gingerly walking out of darkness aren't we? Out of a long darkness of disconcertion and claustrophobia, COVID and lockdowns, traffic lights and crowd limits, the anxiety and aggravation of the last few years, into something like a normal everyday life. A life in which we are called to walk a little better, bathed in an ever-renewing mercy, steeped in a steadfast love, raised to walk in a newness of life. So perhaps we should take a minute to take stock of what we've learned and what we've unlearned. I always love when there are sort of themes that you can feel coming, because I knew I was speaking on Romans 8, and we had two beautiful children turn 8, and I was speaking on getting back up and keeping going, uh, and we, the kids are upstairs learning about resiliency God sometimes just superintends his conversations. We're going to spend some time in Romans 8. And if you recall that the the sort of the, the verse from Romans 8, if you know one, will be Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. But can you recall the context of those words? Do you remember in Romans 8, 15 and 17, how Paul speaks to us as adopted, received in the spirit of sonship? He says that we are crying Abba, Abba Father, to God, that we hear the Spirit testify that we are indeed God's children, that we've been written into the will that we are vested with the family fortune, that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, we now stand to inherit. But that beautiful, intimate, glorious note, our complete acceptance by God, comes with an if. If we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. Paul continues in verses 18 to 21, I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. And he speaks of a whole world waiting, all creation groaning in eager anticipation, yearning to be set free from its bondage to decay and brought back in freedom. He talks of a world screaming in childbirth, of immense pain and immense beauty, the searing beauty of the gasp that welcomes new life. Have you felt it? The world groaning for freedom? The pain of eagerly waiting to be welcomed as a family? I have. And Paul speaks of us as we ourselves, first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and the redemptions of our body.
In Romans 8, 24 and 25, Paul says, For in this hope we are all saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. There's this interesting view of what Paul, what Paul talks about hope is that, is that hope happens out of sight. Either our hope in the final things, the, the coming kingdom, the things that we will eventually receive, or our hope in the invisible things, the presence of God, the, the dwelling of the, the Spirit in the community, or just our hope in those things that God hasn't yet brought to light. The things that for right now are in darkness. And we are supposed to be creatures of hope. People who can trust in God and lean in God and lean on God and know that God loves us so that we can look both to the end of all things and Christ's return and the final kingdom, to the invisible things among us and to those things that God is bringing to light that we don't yet see. Invest our hope in those things so we don't get confused by what happens around us and think that God isn't here, that God isn't working, that God is being thwarted and that God doesn't have something for us. And there's something about having the Spirit that, also, that, that almost makes the darkness around us a little worse. Something about having a taste of God's goodness and blessing that can make it harder, can't it? We've had glimpses of heaven. We can smell the lingering incense of God's presence. And yet here we are, groaning in a groaning world, longing for God. We've seen the light that makes the darkness, we've seen the light, and that makes the darkness of this world seem even darker. Or more correctly, in his unapproachable light, we finally see the world as dark as it really is. And God feels it too. Romans 8, 6 to 27, in the same way. The Spirit helps in our weakness, for we do not know how we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So we find ourselves sighing with God, longing for the kingdom to come in fullness, hearing the Spirit pray prayers that we can't even begin to piece together. And that's when we hear Paul say, and we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. Romans 8.28 says, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. So that squarely within His loving foreknowledge, we know that God's working togetherness in the world will use the circumstances of this life to continue the good work of conforming, him to the, conforming us to the image of His Son. Life, if given over to God, even the hard and dark times of life will continue God's never-ending task of making us in His image. God will call us, justify us in His grace, and begin our glorification. As John and St. Edward said, grace is our glory begun. Glory is grace perfected. Thanks, Siri. <laughs> that is too awesome. I want to know who Siri calls at the end of that. <laughs> now calling your mother. <laughs> the good news is that there will not be, the good news is not that there will be no bad news. The good news is that we grow by grace as we suffer in the groaning and grieving of the world. That hard times given to God do us good. Bad news is an occasion for God's good work. So all news is good news. That in our suffering we found a rugged perseverance, and in our rugged perseverance we've watched the blossoming of our character, and in the blossoming of our newly formed character we've found hope. 
Do you remember that from Romans 5? Let us rejoice in our sufferings because we know that our suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint us. It's important to notice that in the context of that verse, perseverance means continuing to suffer and character means continuing to suffer well and hope means Suffering well without letting it touch the things that God has promised you and touch who you know you are in Christ. That verse doesn't pretend that there won't be hard times or that they'll immediately go away. Rather, that verse promises us that God can work our good through those hard times. In Romans 8.35, Paul asks... Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, Paul is about to say, For I am convinced that neither life nor death, nor angels nor demons, nor, sorry, nor powers, nor angels nor principalities, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love that is ours in Christ Jesus. But let's let him answer his question first Who shall separate us from the love of, of Christ? He asked this, and good and godly Jew that he was, he answers his question with a question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Shall trouble separate us from the love of God? Distress, persecution, famine? He quotes Psalm 44. For the sake of death all day long, we are being slaughtered. We are being considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Psalm 44 is a great place to sit if you're unsure of where life is headed. Because the top of Psalm 44 says, God did great things for our ancestors did incredible things, that, that by him we, we conquered our enemies, by him we entered the land, by him, and it, and it lists out sort of the greatest hits of the Old Testament. But then it goes on to say, but na- now, I don't feel it. Now we're, we're lined up as sheep to be slaughtered. Now we're, and it calls out to God, in the midst of that ambivalence, knowing that God has done wonderful things, knowing that the context right now is, is incredibly difficult. Because sometimes we look at the Scripture and, and we just drain it of all the verses that don't fit on a, on a, on a nice card or, or something that we can share on Instagram with a picture of two ballet shoes. And we take out all of those important verses that talk to us about those hard times and about those dark times that show the people of God in the New Testament and the Old Testament calling out and crying out to God in difficult times and showing how God sustains His people in hard times. But none of that answers His question, does it? Rather, it just confirms the stakes of the question. Does trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword separate us from God? Why does Paul ask that? Well, he asks it because we are troubled and we are distressed and we are persecuted and we are hungry and endangered and threatened. And if these things divide us from God, we are lost. Because the, but because, the, and because these things are true, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Then finally, in verse 37, Paul's answer comes. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. In all these things, in the trouble, in the distress, in the persecution, in the famine, in the nakedness, in the danger, in the sword. In these things we find victory. Matthew Henry called it a strange way of conquering. 
but Christ's way. In all these things, we can find victory. In all these things, God will work for the good of those who love him. In all things, God will work for good, but all things will include these things. The lesson is not to expect only hard times, and the lesson is not to expect only good times. The lesson is to expect God to keep working whatever the times are. God can use any, all, and every circumstance to make us more like Christ. And when we understand that in God's foreknowledge, we are marked as God's people. And Sorry, when we understand that, in God's foreknowledge, we are not marked in God's people. And that in a way that is not contingent on our outward success. That's the incredible thing about it, saying that those God foreknew. Those God foreknew that, that his foreknowledge before, before the creation of the world, his foreknowledge before anything happened, God already saw us coming. Good days are not pro- about proof that we are gods. We were gods before there were days. But God always intended to use anything and everything to make us more like Jesus. N.T. Wright, speaking of this verse, said, Being conformed to the image of God's Son is in fact what God has purposed for us all along. We are thus marked out as God's people. Not outwardly, but in the secret prayers and loves of our inmost being, we can be completely sure that God is in charge and He can bring good out of whatever happens. Whatever happens, God can use it. God is always watching. And so we can pray like Paul in, first, in 2 Corinthians 1. Praise be to the God of our Father Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we abundantly share in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds. As we share in the suffering, our comfort abounds. The comfort comes in the suffering, in the hard time. And that's how we're offered victory. That's how we're offered triumph. That's how we'll be more than conquerors. We will not be saved from our hard times. We will be saved in our hard times. We will be saved through our hard times. Now that doesn't mean that God can't work in joy. Because there are times, like in the words of Nehemiah 8, verse 10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. There are times and days when mourning is forbidden. That's mourning with a U. When being sad, when crying, when grieving is forbidden. When God says, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet. There are days when the task of the man of God is to, to declare feast and festival and to speak celebration and sacrament over the people of God. Days when the prophets announce this day is holy unto the Lord. In Nehemiah 8, they've just rebuilt the wall. They have a sense of safety and they've just read out the law. And they have a renewed understanding of who they are and what God requires of them. And so they take some time to feast and fate his faithfulness. They celebrate his loving kindness in the midst of their new safety and security. But they've also just passed through captivity. They're mature enough to know that Nehemiah 9 follows Nehemiah 8. And in Nehemiah 9, all of Israel gathers together to have a time of the reading of the law and a time of confession, where there's contrition and fasting. And it says, they stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors, where they praised God meekly after a time of humble self-reflection. There's been a concerted effort in culture to try and make it wrong to admit to the sins of our ancestors. And there's been a concerted effort in culture to try to 
hang on our shoulders the sins of all our ancestors. And in Christ, we can say we are fully forgiven, but we can also come as the people of the Lord and say, this is what I've done, and this is what my people have done. So, Lord, we ask for your mercy. So we have both a honesty about ourselves that isn't undermined by mistakes we've made and an honesty about ourselves corporately and ourselves as a historical people that is honest about the mistakes that we've made so that we can be people of truth. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now use that joy and the strength to get through the dark times, whether that darkness is external, trouble, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, and sword, or internal. A long, hard look at our personal and corporate past. God will give us the joy and strength to grow from them. And that's why, in a kind of confusing verse at first glance, James tells us to consider it pure joy when things are hard. James 1 verse 2 through, 4 says, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking, not lacking anything. That's the goal. Not peace or prosperity, but maturity and completeness. Two beautiful words, one of which I can pronounce and the other which I can't. Telios means brought to its end. The telos of something was the goal of something. But so if something was telioi, it meant it was either perfect or perfect for the thing that it will become. So you can imagine Michelangelo looking at his statue of David saying, it's perfect. That's telos. But you can also imagine Michelangelo looking at the big piece of marble from which he will carve his David and going, it's perfect. It's exactly what I need to do what I want. And we're called to be telos people, to be on our way to completion. And the other word, here we go, holokleros, I think I got that right. <laughs> Means complete in all of its parts. In no part wanting or unsound. Complete, entire, whole. If it's talking of a body, it speaks of being without blemish or defect. If it's talking about a soul, it's talking about being free from sin or faultless. Com complete in all respects or consummate. Just looking at the way mature and complete are uh, translated in the different versions of Scripture lets you see the, the different ways in which you can view these. So we have in the NIV, mature and complete. We have New Living Translation, perfect and complete. You have my favorite, the King James Bible, that we would be perfect and entire. I think entire, this is such a holistic, that I would have all of you and have all of you be well. And all of you be what you, I want you to be. The Amplified Bible says we would be perfect and completely developed in our faith. And the CEV says that we would be completely mature. God wants you to be complete and mature without blemish. Lest you think that achieving is the key to avoiding hard times. Remember that Christ was complete and mature without blemish. Christ is often the complete foil to our bad theology. Someone will, will, will intimate that if you're righteous enough and you ask God for something, God will give it to you. And then they'll tell you that Christ is perfect and Christ will sit in Gethsemane going, Dear Lord, I do not want this to happen. And the thing that God, Christ doesn't want to happen, wants not to happen, happens. If righteousness could guarantee the answer of our prayers, then Gethsemane would be a story of the triumphant answering of God's prayer. Right? Jesus calls out, I don't want to do this.
If righteousness, maturity, completeness was enough to not have struggle, Jesus' story wouldn't have ended in the cross, but it did. And think of what got achieved through the cross. Think of what got achieved through that struggle. Think of what got achieved through that difficulty. Without blemish is sacrifice language. If you look it up, you'll discover it scattered throughout the Old Testament. You will bring to me a lamb without blemish. You will bring to me the first fruit of your flock without blemish. You will bring to me a goat, perfect and without blemish. It described an animal fit to be offered to God. It's what Paul has in mind when he tells us to be living sacrifices. I said at the beginning of the sermon that our task is to walk from daily dying and communal burial of last week to week and bloom and blessing of next week. So I don't want to spend any more time talking about darkness and hard times. Rather, what I want to do is bank all of what I've just said. Take all of that as given. And say this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And then God said, let there be light, and there was. And God separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day and the darkness night. And there was evening, and there was morning, day one. You guys remember this bit? It's from January 1st on your three-month-long commitment to read through Scripture. Right? Genesis through the middle of Deuteronomy. Skip to the New Testament. (laughs) I did that every year for so long. It's interesting that God makes light, but he doesn't name it light. He doesn't say, let there be light, and I shall call this thing light. He says, he called the light day. God makes light, but he doesn't name it light. He separates out the darkness, but he doesn't call it darkness. Do you ever wonder why? Light is abstract. Day is experienced. Day is what light is for us. God, in pulling the world from chaos and emptiness, knew that life would run in a regular cadence of dark to light. That's why there was evening and then morning the first day. First it got dark, then it got brighter. And each time it got brighter, God had more in his hand. And each time the sun rose, God had more to do, more that he could achieve, more that he could accomplish. We talked last week about making Easter a part of the the pattern for our communal life, that it should involve a, a daily dying, a corporate farewelling, and a regular resurrection in large and small ways as we seek a newness of life. But that pattern starts literally in the first pages of Scripture. Light is given to us, but not only light. In fact, the first experience we have of light in Scripture is of it fading. There was evening, and then there was morning, the first day. But over and over again, we experience the return of light. Light returns. It comes back. Hope is the knowledge that light returns. That the truth is not decided by what we can see. It's being certain of those things unseen. Lamentations 3 starts in a dark place. It says, I am a man who has seen affliction. By the rod of the Lord's wrath, he has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. And the book gets really dark. It is, after all, a book of lamentations. But the writer stops himself from dwelling on the hard times. In verse 21. And says, yet I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. And what he deliberately tells himself is this, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And in verse 31, no one is cast off by the Lord forever. 
We greet the world new every morning, and God greets us new every morning. Dark times come, yes, but they are God's. That was the lesson of day one, when there was evening and then the morning. The sun rises, day return, light will come to us again. That's why the Sabbath was celebrated from sunset to sunset. You declared a Sabbath and then walked into the darkness and into the new day, the day that you'd given to God. Light is where we end up. There's a beautiful verse in Revelation 21. It's talking about the the new city of the Lord, and it says, I saw no temple in the city because the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, and the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. We have a little more insight than the writers of Genesis and Lamentation. We get, back to, we get to look back at those lessons through the lens of Christ. While we read Genesis and learn that God can create a whole universe in six light-bathed days, we know that God and Christ can kick off a, a whole new creation in six hours of darkness. God working day shift can give us creation for a God working day shift for a week can give us creation and Jesus working night shift for the weekend can give us salvation. Both are a gift. God works in both. God gives to us through both. And that means as we move from a dark time, as we breathe in the morning air, we can use the light of this new day to look for what God did on night shift. God has blessed you. He's grown you. He's prospered you in the hard times in ways that you may not be aware of. Look for them and rejoice in the increase that God has provided. We are done an incredible disservice by our calendar in the Southern Hemisphere. Because the people that planned the Christian calendar were in the Northern Hemisphere. And they thought about, how do you celebrate Jesus? How do you celebrate the coming of of Jesus into the world? And they said, well, let's make it at at, at the middle of winter. Let's make it on the, the longest night of the year. Let's make it deep in the darkness, on the Yuletide, that we'll celebrate Jesus coming. And then when do we celebrate his death and his resurrection? Well, perfect. Let's celebrate it at the beginning of spring. Let's celebrate the end of that darkness. Let's celebrate the blessing that God brought us of Easter weekend as the world bounces back into life. All of the sort of the non-biblical images of Easter are all images of life. We eat eggs and rabbits. No, we don't eat rabbits. We eat chocolate rabbits. It'd be, it'd be nice to eat the rabbits, but I have to explain to my children why they had killed the bunny. But if you hand them a chocolate rabbit, they just want to bite their head off. So. But we wrap ourselves in these images of new life. But in, in the southern hemisphere, we do that as it gets colder, as it gets darker. Instead of living the metaphor of the seasons and saying, this is come, we've come around one more time. Look, the world is waking up. The world's about to bloom. The world that laid fallow in the cold and long darkness of winter is about to erupt into life and flies. And into all the movement and hubbub of the world in spring. And we miss that just because we forgot to rewrite the calendar. That's cool, but we're going to celebrate at the other end. You're really nice, quick Christmas in the middle of winter. Right when we weren't all on holiday. But we're now following that, that path just backwards. As we breathe in the morning air, we can use the light of the new way to look for what God did.
as you come out of hard times, you'll be able to see what God does. I was been speaking to Nathan this week. And last week we had this the, the, the brilliant, and I've lost the name. What was the name of the group? Catalyst. The brilliant Catalyst group who were with us. And we had some young people from all kinds of different churches and all kinds of different walks of life who came with us to pray with us and, and, and to, to, to rejoice with us and sing with us and cause to worship. And it was a beautiful service. And they then went to Nathan and they prayed for him. And they prayed the obvious thing you pray to someone with a whole bunch of bandages on his knee. They prayed for healing. And they prayed the thing that you pray if you're praying for healing and you're a little bit Pentecostal is they prayed for miracle, miraculous healing. And they laid on hands and they called God. The thing is, the person that wasn't praying with them was Nathan. Not that he didn't want God to heal him, he did. Not that he was not wanting to enter in their prayers, he did. But the, the thing that Nathan found difficult about trying to enter into that prayer was he'd become aware of how much good the break was doing him. If God had healed Nathan, Nathan would be back here, not experiencing the good that the break was doing him. Not being built into him in the way that this forced Sabbath was building into him. And because he could see that, he could say, yeah, this is hard. It's frustrating. I can't really use my legs. I've got COVID. But man, I needed to sit down. And God sat me down. I needed to take a deep breath and God let me breathe deep. It made me cough at the end of it, but God let me breathe deep. And when you get to the point that you say, this is hard, but what is God doing? You get to this odd point where you look back at the hard times as times of profound blessing. When I moved to Thames, I was going to come out into a caravan, and about two months later, we were going to start a house build. And we were all going to move into a house. Eighteen months later, the council gave us permission to build. That year, it rained in Periri for a month straight. And I was living in a paddock that I hadn't yet dug the drainage in with my children, three dogs, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, and a tent. And all seven of us, to our two dogs, my, my three boys, me and my wife, would climb into a single caravan at night. Just this incredible smell of wet dog. And we'd fall asleep. It's really, we, the odor of wet dog is really good for your love life. So, <laughs> so is having three children just on the other side of a curtain. There was some suffering involved. But I tell you this, I almost miss it. God did some wonderful things in that room. God worked some tight closeness to my, with my boys that I would never, ever pray to undo. God brought us together in a, in a way as a family that I, I wasn't expecting. And I look back at those times, and every once in a while, I'll see a big caravan and go, maybe we should just move to a caravan for a while. Maybe we should just find a paddock in the rain. Maybe we could take our two dogs because Mike and Mary's dog is really annoying. God blesses you. Maybe you've looked back on an honestly humiliating time and realized what God did to your character as your sins were brought to light. Maybe you'll look back. Maybe you'll look through back through COVID. And look at your significant other and think of how much they taught you about patience. Or how much you taught them about patience. I learned from working at home how much work my wife did that I just didn't know. Not that I was trying to avoid it or trying to ignore it. And if I thought about it, sure. But she, working from home, still worked full time on home. And I decided I was going to start helping and started taking over meals and taking over tasks. And it turns out that not being useless makes your wife a little more happier. But God grows you during hard times. 
There's an interesting tension between that verse and Revelation that we just read out. 21 23, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. If you look at that verse, there's a paralleling between the sun and the moon and the glory of God as the light, as the sun, and the moon as the lamp. Right? Does that make sense? that there's a sun and a moon and we have a light and a lamp, because lamps are how we get about at night, right? Lamps are what which, that gives Christ in place of the moon as our lamp. The moon and lamps are how we see at night. But interestingly, in verse 22.5, it says, There will be no more night, for they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, For God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. I was like, why would we need Jesus as a lamp if there's no more night? Why would we need Jesus as a... Like, it it kind of feels like, okay, well, wait, wait, we've got got sun and moon, right? And and, and in Genesis 1, the sun and moon were what lit the day and the night, right? The, The greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And we arrive in Revelation 22, and there's, there's no more night, but we've just been told we have, we'll have a lamp, and a lamp forever. But then we remember that we're not talking about darkness, we're talking about night. And just as day is light that's experienced, night is darkness that's experienced. Just as day is light for us, night is darkness for us, and we won't experience it as darkness Because Jesus will always be with us and always giving us light. There is always a light on in the universe. Jesus is on night shift. So as a Christian, a profound optimism can pervade all that we do. If God is growing us in dark times, we can greet the dawn and instead of saying, the hard times are over, I can finally get better. We can simply say, I have never been better. We may not feel it. We may not see it yet. But the God who makes all things work together for the good is making sure that it is true. As we walk toward the future... We get to know that God has been working with us and for us and in us and making plans to work through us. As we walk toward the future, we get to know that the hard times that we go through, the suffering that happens, God foreknew and preordained those hard times as part of our being conformed to the image of Christ, that we somehow, in some important low-level way, look more like Jesus now than we did then. Maybe it's our ability to forgive. Maybe it's our ability to listen. Maybe it's just a newfound joy of outside and other people that God wants to turn into ministry. We won't know it yet, but we have a hope for it, and that hope is certain because God is always doing things we can't see. And Jesus is always working on night shift. So as we walk toward the future with this incredible optimism that as that through the night we grew. And now that day has come, we can open out and bloom. That's next week's sermon. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you've been doing in us and through us. And I thank you for the hard lessons that you teach us in the hard times. And I thank you for the grace that you give us in the good times. And I thank you that as we walk together as as participants in your Son, that we are inheritors of all that Jesus achieved for us in the hours of darkness at Easter. 
that as we walk together in participants of your Son, that we are always in the presence of the Spirit who brings us light and guidance and truth. That as we walk together, we can look in the light of the morning and see the good that you achieved for us. So Father, grow us until we are mature and complete. Make of us what you want. Take us all the way to your final design. And help us see in the world what you have planned for us. And help us see in the light what we can achieve for you and help us see in the darkness what you are working in us. Father, can we always know your presence and understand your plan? And can we always become more and more and more like Jesus? Be with us in Christ's name.